This is a film about a voyage to the famous McMurdo Sound in the Ross Sea in deepest Antarctica. To get to McMurdo Sound and back, the total distance sailed was 6,400 nautical miles or 12,000 kilometers. Austral summer sea ice frequently prevents easy entrance to the Ross Sea, making it necessary to find a gap in the sea ice using satellite photographs. Of course, due to winds and currents, the sea ice is not static, and so a gap in the sea ice through to the Ross Sea, as seen in a satellite photo, might close up before we got through it, thus preventing our entry. As the sea ice thickened, our progress from the Amundsen Sea towards the Ross Sea slowed. Our ice strengthened ship with its UL1 ice classification could only navigate through solid one-year sea ice and loose multi-year pack ice. However, it's not an icebreaker and with only 4300 horsepower, it could only push its way through the ice flows. Occasionally, ice turned over by the ship would reveal colorful algae that lives on the underside. As seen on the ship's radar, we were surrounded by heavy pack ice with seemingly no easy way forward. The weather changed constantly, swinging from cold and overcast one hour to warm and sunny the next. However, the dense pack ice did not change. brought our progress to a standstill, so one of the helicopters was dispatched on an ice reconnaissance to find a way forward. Fortunately, the good news from the ice reconnaissance was that pack ice free water was not that far ahead, so the captain set a new course and off we went again. On the final ice flows, we saw a number of animals, including crab-eater seals and penguins. We passed by an emperor penguin stuck on an ice flow until its annual molting was over, and it had a new coat of feathers. Its old feathers littered the ice flow. The other one should go in soon. In a short while, we were largely free from the pack ice and through to the mainly ice-free waters of the Ross Sea, where we were greeted by a pod of minke whales. The captain turned the ship hard to starboard to allow us a better view of the pod. The Antarctic minke whale is the second smallest baleen whale. A mature male measures about 7 meters and typically weighs 5 tons. Minke whales can live up to 50 years. Surprisingly, we came upon the rarely seen sight of a pod of orca hunting down and killing a minke whale. The maximum swimming speed of minkies has been estimated at 38 kilometers per hour. Their speed is their only defense mechanism when pursued by orca or Japanese whalers. Unfortunately, Japan still hunts the Antarctic minke whale. The orca or killer whale is the largest member of the dolphin family, with a mature adult measuring about 7 meters and typically weighing 6 tons. Orca are apex predators, as no animals prey on them. Orca predation on minke whales is not uncommon, but it is rarely observed. Studies have found that the orcas like to eat the minke's tongue and lower jaw. It was not known how long the orca had been chasing the minke before we saw them, but sometimes these chases last for hours until the minke whale tires out, allowing the orca to finally close in and kill their prey. 
The orca's large size and strength make it among the fastest of marine animals, able to reach speeds in excess of 56 kilometers per hour, which is faster than the minke whale. Orca are sometimes called wolves of the sea because they hunt in a group like a pack of wolves. The coordination of the orca attack on the minke that we witnessed was obvious. Once the orca tired out the minke, the pod of orca attacked it by biting it about the throat and swimming over top of it to make it harder for the minke to breathe or to simply drown it. During the pursuit, the orca flanked the minke from all sides, preventing its escape. They rammed its sides repeatedly to weaken the minke and even swam on top of it, forcing its head underwater. Oh, there's blood in the water too. They're tearing something apart. Oh. Yeah, right. Somebody is bleeding badly. Yeah. Once stopped, the struggle was one-sided as minkies do not physically defend themselves. Rather, they depend on their endurance swimming at speed. So when the whale is tired out by the pursuit, the outcome is certain. When the minke stopped moving, the orca feasted on it before it sank too deep. As the whale was being ripped apart, seabirds, including snow petrels, flocked around the kill site looking for scraps of food. With the bite wounds, oil flowed out of the minke whale's blubber, creating a sheen on the ocean surface around the whale. After witnessing the death of the minke whale, the sight of the two meter tall dorsal fin of a male orca rising out of the ocean was even more impressive and ominous. After over half of an hour of observing the drama, we moved on, but the orca continued to feed on the minke carcass. The death of the minke whale at the jaws of the orca demonstrated to us why sailors of old called these mammals whale killers. This name was eventually flipped around to become killer whale.
With the sea ice free, we made good time towards the Bay of Wales, which would be our furthest penetration south. We then made the 600 km long transit along the front of the Ross Ice Shelf to McMurdo off the apparently endless Ross Ice Shelf at 2 a.m., but there was still plenty of light to see the minke whales. The Ross Ice Shelf is the largest ice shelf in Antarctica, with an area about the size of France. It is several hundred meters thick, with a nearly vertical ice front to the open ocean, and it's more than 600 kilometers long, and between 15 to 50 meters high above the water surface. Unfortunately, Japan still hunts the Antarctic minke whale. The ice shelf is named after Sir James Clerk Ross, who discovered it on the 28th of January, 1841, and called it the Barrier, as it prevented him sailing further south. Finally, we arrived at the end of the Bay of Wales, some 1,300 kilometers from the South Pole, where we could go no further due to the ice shelf. This was the area where, in 1911, Roald Amundsen started his successful dog sled journey to become the first human to reach the South Pole on 14 December 1911. All five members of his party returned. Five weeks later, Robert Scott, starting from Ross Island, also reached the South Pole, but this time by man-hauling sleds. Tragically, all five members of his party died on the return journey. Ice shells are thick plates of ice that float atop an ocean and are fed continuously by inland glaciers. The Ross Ice Shelf pushes out to sea at between 1.5 to 3 kilometers a day. Sometimes fissures and cracks cause part of the shelf to break off as huge tabular icebergs. The largest known is about 31,000 square kilometers, which is slightly larger than Belgium. This iceberg, known as B-15, is the world's largest recorded iceberg and was calved from the Ross Ice Shelf during March 2000. Over the years, it broke into huge pieces, which in turn moved past McMurdo Sound and along the Victoria Land coast into the Southern Ocean. The Fata Morgana mirage along the Ross Ice Shelf was very interesting. We were lucky to be approached by a pod of orca. The orca, or killer whale, is the largest member of the dolphin family with a mature adult measuring about seven meters and typically weighing six tons. Orca are apex predators as no animals prey on them. The orca's large size and strength make it among the fastest of marine animals, able to reach speeds in excess of 56 kilometers per hour. Orca are sometimes called wolves of the sea because they hunt in a group like a pack of wolves. Fresh in our memories was the scene that we had recently witnessed of a pod of orca attacking and killing a minke whale. The trip leaders decided that the conditions weren't right for a helicopter landing on the ice shelf at Cape Crozier, so we sailed on to McMurdo Sound, scanning the ice folds for penguins and seals. After sailing past the Ross Ice Shelf, we spent days exploring the McMurdo Sound area. Many days were spent sailing to and fro, waiting for the winds to die down and the seas to calm so that we could go ashore. In the end, we were able to go ashore three times, firstly at Taylor Valley, Cape Evans, and then Cape Bird. As well, we were able to visit McMurdo Station. While sailing about, we sometimes had good opportunities to see wildlife, including seals, penguins, and orca. Wildlife on the ice folds mainly didn't react to the passage of the ship. However, occasionally seals or penguins would react and hurriedly re-enter the sea. It was fascinating to see the sight of penguins porpoising along. While penguins can't fly through the air with their flippers, many penguin species take to the air as they launch themselves out of the water. Just before doing so, they release air bubbles from their feathers. This cuts down the drag on their bodies, allowing them to double or triple their swimming speeds quickly and to launch into the air. 
The ship was in position in McMurdo Sound for a helicopter visit to the dry valleys. However, high winds prevented any helicopter operations for several days, but as we waited for the winds to subside, we could watch the Adelie penguins and even a couple of emperor penguins coming and going at the edge of the vast area of fast ice. Adelie penguins normally hunt prey within the first 50 meters of the sea, where light availability is greatest, but they can descend to 170 meters if required. Their prey is mainly krill, Watching corpulent seals moving on ice was like watching an earthworm moving about. Occasionally we'd see the fascinating sight of a large group of penguins entering the sea all at once. How they didn't run into each other remains a mystery. As schools prey on penguins, it was surprising to see the two standing virtually cheek to jowl. Every now and then, some emperor penguins would appear, which caused great excitement amongst the passengers. Emperor penguins are the largest of the penguin species and noticeably larger than the Adelie penguins. Finally, the gale wind died down and the seas calmed so that we were able to fly into Taylor Valley. This is the southernmost of the three large dry valleys in the Trans-Antarctic Mountains of Victoria Land. Taylor Valley was discovered in the austral summer of 1903-1904 by the British National Antarctic Expedition led by Robert Scott. Scott and his party were returning from a 240 km trek onto the Polar Plateau when they entered Taylor Valley, the southernmost of the McMurdo Dry Valleys. The dry valleys are so named because of their extremely low humidity and lack of snow or ice covering, making the region one of the world's most extreme deserts. In fact, precipitation only averages around 100 millimeters per year, all in the form of snow. The powerful catabatic winds rapidly evaporate the snow, so little melts into the soil. The major reasons that the valleys are so dry are twofold. Firstly, the surrounding mountains block the seaward flowing ice from the East Antarctic Ice Sheet from reaching the Ross Sea, and secondly, the powerful catabatic winds that can reach speeds up to 320 km per hour evaporate all water, ice and snow. We flew by some rocky islets with mysterious ice pinnacles dotting their surface. These were the only ice pinnacles that we saw during our voyage. At 4,800 square kilometers, the valleys constitute the largest ice-free region in Antarctica. The huge fan-shaped terminus of the Commonwealth Glacier is very impressive. The glacier was named by Robert Scott in 1911 for the Commonwealth of Australia. Scientists consider the dry valleys the closest of any terrestrial environment to that of the planet Mars, and thus an important source of insight into possible extraterrestrial life. We landed near the terminus of the Canada Glacier in glorious sunshine.
Despite these images, it's hard to visualize the beautiful scene that we were presented with when we stepped off the helicopter at the foot of the Canada Glacier. The glacier positively glistened under a brilliant sun and a bright blue sky. As elsewhere around McMurdo Sound, the area where visitors can land and walk about in Taylor Valley is restricted to a specific visitor zone with a designated path. The valley floor is covered with coarse, loose gravel. It was amazing to see an emaciated, mummified crab-eater seal. However, there's no widely accepted explanation as to why this seal ended up some 25 kilometers from the sea. It's not even clear how old the mummy is, as carbon dating results range between 100 and 2600 years. Too soon, it was time to board the helicopter for the return flight to the ship. After leaving the Dry Valley's area, we sailed deeper into McMurdo Sound towards McMurdo Station. McMurdo Station is a U.S. research center on the tip of Ross Island, a territory claimed by New Zealand. McMurdo is the largest station in Antarctica, capable of supporting 1,200 residents. Mount Erebus, which dominates Ross Island, was named by James Ross after one of his ships in 1841. We were lucky that our visit coincided with Operation Deep Freeze, the annual resupply sea lift to McMurdo Station. Hence, we were able to see the United States Coast Guard icebreaker Polar Star in action as it patrolled the wide channel that it had cut into the ice to allow cargo ships to reach McMurdo's harbor. The Polar Star is the only icebreaker in the United States fleet large enough to break the heavy sea ice to access McMurdo Station. The Polar Star, the United States only operational heavy icebreaker, was commissioned in 1976 and is near the end of its useful service life. The 13,000 ton Polar Star is able to break through ice up to 6.4 meters thick by backing up and ramming and can steam continuously through 1.8 meters of ice at 3 knots. To break the channel into McMurdo Station for resupply, the Polar Star makes an annual 18,500 km voyage from its home port to McMurdo Sound. After its arrival in McMurdo Sound, the Polar Star starts cutting a wide navigable channel through the seasonal and multi-year ice, sometimes as much as 6.4 meters thick. Once it is cut, the powerful catapatic south winds sweep the broken ice out of the channel. However, the cool temperatures cause the open water to slowly freeze over, so the Polar Star continuously patrols the channel to keep it from refreezing. 
As our ship sailed down the channel cut by the polar star, we passed by the polar star itself and pushed through newly formed grease ice that was on its way to forming new ice. Along the ice edges on either side of the channel were seals, skuas, and Adelian Emperor penguins. At McMurdo's pier was the U.S. cargo freighter Ocean Giant offloading its cargo. Nearby on Hut Point is Discovery Hut which was built by Robert Falcon Scott for the British National Antarctic Expedition of 1902. McMurdo Station was built by the United States and opened in 1956 as part of Operation Deep Freeze. Atop Observation Hill is a 3 meter wooden cross erected in 1913 and inscribed with the names of Scott's ill-fated South Pole Party and the final line of Alfred Tennyson's poem Ulysses, which reads, To strive, to seek, to find, and not to yield. Unfortunately, we weren't able to land at McMurdo Station as station management felt that our presence would interfere with the unloading of the resupply ship. Hence, we sailed back up the channel towards our next destination of Cape Evans. Water sky is the dark appearance of the underside of a cloud layer when it is over a surface of open water. Water sky is useful in ice navigation because one can tell if open water is present. As we were sailing up the channel, a pod of Type C Orca was cruising down the channel towards McMurdo Station. After the seasonal ice breaking has begun, these Orca take advantage of the foraging habitat made accessible by this channel. The Orca were wasting no time as they headed towards the newly opened hunting grounds. Cool. Yeah. Wow. At the end of the channel, we again passed by the Polar Star and the tanker Maersk Perry, which had been parked in the pack ice until McMurdo's Pier was free. The Maersk Perry was designed for working in the polar regions and delivers fuel to Thule Air Force Base in Greenland in the Arctic summer and to McMurdo Station in the Austral summer. A month later, I came across the Polar Star tied up alongside in Wellington, New Zealand, as it was on its return voyage to Seattle. Mount Erebus, at nearly 3,800 meters, is the southernmost active volcano on Earth. The volcano has been active for about 1.3 million years. In 1979, Air New Zealand Flight 901 on an Antarctic sightseeing flight hit Mount Erebus, killing all 257 people on board. The waves pounding the iceberg at the foot of Mount Erebus made for a fascinating sight as we sailed past. The delis were resting on ice floes and some were on bergy bits. One bergy bit it slowly started rolling over, causing the penguins to slide off into the ocean. Although over a hundred years had passed, my dress for the Cape Evans landing was very similar to that worn by Robert Scott all those years ago. Cape Evans is the most historic site in Antarctica, as it is where Robert Falcon Scott erected a hut for the British Antarctic Expedition of 1910-1913. It was from this hut that he left on his ill-fated trek to the South Pole. The hut remains much as it was when Scott left it. Arriving off Cape Evans, the weather cooperated and so we made the short zodiac ride to the volcanic black sand beach near Scott's Hut. Scott's Hut, prefabricated in England, measures 15 meters by seven and a half meters. It was divided into separate areas for sleeping and working. After 1917, the hut remained untouched until 1956 when US personnel dug it out of the snow and ice. Still stuck in the beach near the hut is the anchor of Shackleton's Ross Sea Party ship Aurora, which in 1915 broke away in a storm, leaving 10 men without many of their provisions. 
During the winter of 1911, 25 men lived in the hut. From there on the 1st of November 1911, Scott and his men set out on the ultimately fatal trek to the South Pole. Scott's party of five reached the pole on the 17th of January, only to find that Amundsen had preceded them by five weeks. Scott wrote in his diary, Great God, this is an awful place. The bodies of Scott and his companions were discovered by a search party on 12 November 1912. Surprisingly, Scott decided to use Manchurian ponies to support his attempt on the pole. Unlike Amundsen's sled dogs, the bigger ponies would plunge through the top layer of snow, making progress too difficult. As well, some of the ponies were eaten by Orca. Outside the hut were crab-eater seals both on the beach and in the water. The scene was much the same as it was in 1911. The large cross on Weathervane Hill was erected by the Ross Sea Party of Shackleton's Imperial Trans-Antarctic Expedition of 1914-1917 in memory of three members of the party who died in the vicinity in 1916. Returning to our ship, the spell cast by the anachronistic Scott Hut was broken but not forgotten. From Cape Evans, we sailed north towards the Cape Bird Penguin Colony at the northern tip of Ross Island. We passed by Cape Royds, but the sea was deemed too rough for a landing. Cape Royds is the site of the historic hut from the British Antarctic Expedition of 1907-1909 that was led by Ernest Shackleton. It's also the site of the southernmost Adelie penguin colony. As there was no exercise space on board, passengers frequently walked in circles around the upper deck. We sailed alongside huge tabular icebergs that had broken off the Ross Sea ice shelf years ago and were slowly making their way along the coast towards the Southern Ocean. The nearest iceberg was some 10 kilometers long and 30 meters above the waterline. We sailed around until the two huge icebergs framed Mount Erebus. On the fast ice between the bergs were seals and penguins resting. Near the huge tabular iceberg, we were lucky to come across a pod of orca hunting for their next meal. A smoking mount Erebus provided an excellent background for this scene.
The hungry orca relentlessly checked out ice floes for seals or penguins and soon found floes with penguins aboard. There were Adelie penguins on ice floes as the orca moved in. The predators of adult and juvenile Adelie penguins at sea are orca and leopard seals. A group of five emperor penguins on a large ice floe was surrounded by a pod of orca circling them. It was fascinating to watch the pod of orca hunting the emperors, just like a pack of African wild dogs hunt their prey. The orca were playing a waiting game to see if the emperors would leave the relative safety of their ice floe. The orca employed spy hopping to keep good track of the penguins. Unfortunately, we didn't wait to see how the hunt played out as we sailed on to the Cape Bird Penguin Colony. Off the Cape Bird Penguin Colony, we boarded Zodiacs to land at the colony. The Cape Bird Colony is spread out along some 10 kilometers of beachfront. We landed at the North Colony, which is the largest, with about 40,000 breeding pairs. On our trip into the beach, we paused at an iceberg to watch a large group of Adelis on the berg. After milling about for a while, finally a group of Adelis started to cascade off the berg. It was a very impressive sight. Come on, more! <laughs> a few of them I have. More! The beach in front of the colony was a hive of activity as the delis came in and went out to sea. At the colony, those who were so inclined had the opportunity for a polar dip. I opted to take the plunge alongside some penguins, which decided to watch from the warmth of the beach. It wasn't a quick dip, as it was painful to walk over the stones on the beach and those that were under the water. At zero degrees, the water was decidedly refreshing and didn't encourage me to linger at all. Once out of the frigid water, the air felt positively balmy. At the end of my polar dip, I was left with lasting respect for the wildlife that lives in the polar sea. As our visit was at the end of the breeding season for the Adali penguins, the chicks were molting and their parents were trying to stop feeding the chicks that were as big as them. However, the chicks didn't like the new arrangement, so would chase their parents around to get food. Finally, after the parents stumbled, the chick caught up and begged again for food, but the parent had either nothing to give or didn't want to give anything, and so the pursuit began again. 
In the relative safety of their rookeries, Adelie chicks may still be taken by skuas and giant petrels. Leaving Cape Bird, we sailed northwards from Ross Island and out of McMurdo Sound towards Cape Adair. Soon we were back in the sea ice and experiencing the ocean swells. We sailed past a trio of emperor penguins stuck on an ice floe until their annual molting was finished and they had a new coat of feathers. As the ship isn't an icebreaker, it gingerly pushed through the pack ice, leaving a clear track behind before the track rapidly closed up. As we headed further north, the ocean swells increased in size, causing one to slide about in bed at times. The setting sun brought a fitting close to our excellent adventures in the historic McMurdo Sound area. Take me somewhere nice